recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Missy, Guangzhou, China. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 4 Home and Its Sorrows. A green valley, with a brook running through it, full almost to overflowing with the late rains, overhung by low stooping willows. Across this brook a plank is thrown, and over this plank Adam Bede is passing with his undoubting step, followed close by Jip with the basket, evidently making his way to the thatched house with a stack of timber by the side of it, about twenty yards up the opposite slope. The door of the house is open, and an elderly woman is looking out but she is not placidly contemplating the evening sunshine she has been watching with dim eyes the gradually enlarging speck which for the last few minutes she has been quite sure is her darling son adam lisbeth bede loves her son with the love of a woman to whom her firstborn has come late in life she is an anxious spare yet vigorous old woman clean as a snowdrop her gray hair is turned neatly back under a pure linen cap with a black band round it her broad chest is covered with a buff neckerchief, and below this you see a sort of short bedgown made of blue checkered linen, tied round the waist and descending to the hips, from whence there is a considerable length of linsey woolsey petticoat. For Lisbeth is tall, and in other points too there is a strong likeness between her and her son Adam. Her dark eyes are somewhat dim now, perhaps from too much crying, but her broadly marked eyebrows are still black, her teeth are sound, and as she stands knitting rapidly and unconsciously with her work-hardened hands, she has as firmly upright an attitude as when she is carrying a pail of water on her head from the spring. There is the same type of frame and the same keen activity of temperament in mother and son. But it was not from her that Adam got his well-filled brow and his expression of large-hearted intelligence. Family likeness has often a deep sadness in it. Nature, that great tragic dramatist, knits us together by bone and muscle, and divides us by the subtler web of our brains, blends yearning and repulsion, and ties us by our heartstrings to the beans that jar at us at every moment. We hear a voice with the very cadence of our own, uttering the thoughts we despise. We see eyes, ah, so like our mother's, averted from us in cold alienation, and our last darling child, startles us with the air and gestures of the sister we parted from in bitterness long years ago. The father to whom we owe our best heritage, the mechanical instinct, the keen sensibility to harmony, the unconscious skill of the modeling hand, galls us and puts us to shame by his daily errors. The long-lost mother, whose face we begin to see in the glass as our own wrinkles come, once fretted our young souls with her anxious humors and irrational persistence. It is such a fond, anxious mother's voice that you hear, as Lisbeth says, Well, my lad, it's gone seven by the clock. They'd always stay till the last child's born. They wants thy supper, I'll warrant. Where's Seth? Gone out some as chaplain, I reckon. Ay, ay, Seth at no harm, mother, thee mayst be sure. But where's father? said Adam quickly, as he entered the house, and glanced into the room on the left hand, which was used as a workshop. Hasn't he done the coffin for Thuller? There's the stuff standing just as I left it this morning. Done the coffin, said Elizabeth, following him and knitting uninterruptedly, though she looked at her son very anxiously. Eh, my lad, he went off to Treddleson this forenoon, and's never come back. I doubt he's got to the wagon over through again. A deep flush of anger passed rapidly over Adam's face. He said nothing but threw off his jacket and began to roll up his shirt sleeves again. What art going to do, Adam? said mother, with a tone of look and alarm. Thee wants to go to work again, where well, I hadn't I bit a supper. Adam, too angry to speak, walked into the workshop. But his mother threw down her knitting, and hurrying after him, took hold of his arm, and said in a tone of plaintive remonstrance, Nay, my lad, my lad, thee wanna go without thy supper. There's the taters with the gravy in em, just as thee likes em. I saved em a purpose for thee. Come and have thy supper, come. Let be, said Adam impetuously, shaking her off and seizing one of the planks that stood against the wall. It's fine talking about having supper when here's a coffin promised to be ready at Broxton by seven o'clock tomorrow morning, and ought to have been there by now, and not a nail struck yet. My throat's too full to swallow victuals. Why, thee canst to get the coffin ready, said Lisbeth. Thee'd work thyself to death. It'd take thee all night to do't. 
What signifies how long it takes me? Isn't the coffin promised? Can they bury the man without a coffin? I'd work my right hand off sooner than deceive people with lies of that way. It makes me mad to think on it. I shall overrun these doings before long. I've stood enough of them. Poor Lisbeth did not hear this threat for the first time, and if she had been wise she would have gone away quietly and said nothing for the next hour. But one of the lessons a woman most rarely learns is never to talk to an angry or a drunken man. Lisbeth sat down on the chopping bench and began to cry. And by the time she had cried enough to make her voice very piteous, she burst out into words. "'Nay, my lad, my lad, thee wants to go away and break thy mother's heart and leave thy father to ruin. Thee wants to have him carry me to the churchyard and thee not to follow me. I shanna rush to my grave if I don't see thee at the last, and how's they to let thee know as I'm a-dying if thee'd gone a work in a distant parts? And Seth be like gone otter thee, and thy father not be able to hold a pen for his hand shaken, besides not knowing where thee art. Thee mun forget thy father. Thee mun a be so bitter again him. He were a good father to thee afore he took to the drink. He's a clever workman, and taught thee thy trade, remember, and's never gin me a blow, nor so much as an ill word. No, not even in drink. Thee wants to go hem to the workhouse. Thee own father, and them his was a fine-grown man, and handy at everything almost as thee art thy sent five and twenty year ago, when thee wast a baby at the breast. Lisbeth's voice became louder and choked with sobs, a sort of wail, the most irritating of all sounds where real sorrows are to be borne and real work to be done. Now, mother, don't cry and talk so. Haven't I got enough to vex me without that? What's the use of telling me things as I only think too much on every day? If I didna think on em, why should I do as I do for the sake of keeping things together here? But I hate to be talking where it's no use. I like to keep my breath for doing instead of talking. I know thee does things as nobody else would do, my lad. But thee'd always so hard upon thy further, Adam. Thee thinks nothing too much to do for Seth. Thee snaps me up if ever I find fault with the lad. But thee's so angered with thy feyther, more nor with anybody else. That's better than speaking soft and letting things go the wrong way, I reckon, isn't it? If I wasn't sharp with him, he'd sell every bit of stuff in the yard and spend it on drink. I know there's a duty to be done by my father, but it isn't my duty to encourage him in running headlong to ruin. And what has Seth got to do with it? The lad does no harm, as I know of. But leave me alone, mother, and let me get on th with the work. Lisbeth dared not say any more, but she got up and called Jip, thinking to console herself somewhat for Adam's refusal of the supper she had spread out, in the loving expectation of looking at him while he ate it, by feeding Adam's dog with extra liberality. But Jip was watching his master with wrinkled brow and ears erect, puzzled at this unusual course of things, and though he glanced at Lisbeth when she called him and moved his forepaws uneasily, well knowing that she was inviting him to supper, he was in a divided state of mind, and remained seated on his haunches, again fixing his eyes anxiously on his master. Adam noticed Jip's mental conflict, and though his anger had made him less tender than usual to his mother, it did not prevent him from caring as much as usual for his dog. We are apt to be kinder to the brutes that love us than to the women that love us. Is it because the brutes are dumb? "'Go, Jip. Go, lad,' said Adam in a tone of encouraging command, and Jip, apparently satisfied that duty and pleasure were one, followed Lisbeth into the house-place. But no sooner had he licked up his supper than he went back to his master, while Lisbeth sat down alone to cry over her knitting. Women who are never bitter and resentful are often the most querulous, and if Solomon was as wise as he is reputed to be, I feel sure that when he compared a contentious woman to a continual dropping on a very rainy day, he had not a vixen in his eye, a fury with long nails, acrid and selfish. Depend upon it, he meant a good creature, who had no joy but in the happiness of the loved ones whom she contributed to make life uncomfortable, putting by all the tidbits for them and spending nothing on herself. Such a woman as Lisbeth, for example, at once patient and complaining, self-renouncing and exacting, brooding the live-long day over what happened yesterday and what is likely to happen to-morrow, and crying very readily both at the good and the evil. But a certain awe mingled itself with her idolatrous love of Adam, and when he said, Leave me alone, she was always silenced. So the hours passed, to the loud ticking of the old day clock and the sound of Adam's tools. At last he called for a light and a draught of water. Beer was a thing only to be drunk on holidays, and Lisbeth ventured to say as she took it in, The supper stands ready for thee when thee likest. Dunna sit thee up, mother, said Adam in a gentle tone. He had worked off his anger now, and whenever he wished to be especially kind to his mother, he fell into his strongest native accent and dialect, 
with which at other times his speech was less deeply tinged. "'I'll see to father when he comes home. Maybe he won't come at all to-night. I shall be easier if they eat in bed.' "'Nay, I'll bide till Seth comes. He won't be long now, I reckon.' It was then past nine by the clock, which was always in advance of the days, and before it had struck ten the latch was lifted and Seth entered. He had heard the sound of the tools as he was approaching. "'Why, mother,' he said, "'how is it as father's working so late?' It's none o' thy feyther as is a-workin. Thee might know that well enough if thy head weren't a full o' chapelin. It's thy brother as does everything, for there's niver anybody else o' the way to do nothin. Lisbeth was going on, for she was not at all afraid of Seth, and usually poured into his words all the querulousness which was repressed by her awe of Adam. Seth had never in his life spoken a harsh word to his mother, and timid people always wreak their peevishness on the gentle. But Seth, with an anxious look, had passed into the workshop and said, Addy, how's this? What, father's forgot the coffin? Ay, lad, the old tale. But I shall get it done, said Adam, looking up and casting one of his bright, keen glances at his brother. Why, what's the matter with thee? Thee'd in trouble. Seth's eyes were red, and there was a look of deep depression on his mild face. Yes, Addy, but it's what must be borne and can't be helped. Why, thee's never been to the school, then? School? No, that screw can wait, said Adam, hammering away again. "'Let me take my turn now, and do thee go to bed,' said Seth. "'No, lad, I'd rather go on, now I'm in harness. "'Thee'd help me to carry it to Broxen when it's done. "'I'll call thee up at sunrise. "'Go and eat thy supper and shut the door, so as I mayn't hear mother's talk.' Seth knew that Adam always meant what he said, and was not to be persuaded into meaning anything else. So he turned, with rather a heavy heart, into the house-place. "'Adam's never touched a bit of victual since he's come home,' said Lisbeth. I reckon thee'st had thy supper at some of thy methody folks. Nay, mother, said Seth, I've had no supper yet. Come, then, said Lisbeth, but dunna thee eat the taters, for Adam'll help and ate them if I leave em stannin. He loves a bit of taters and gravy, but he's been so sore and angered he wouldn't eat em, for all I'd put em by a purpose for him. And he's been a threatenin' to go away again, she went on, whimpering, and I'm fast sure he'll go some dunnin' afore him up, and never let me know aforehand, and he'll never come back again when once he's gone. "'and I'd better never had had a son, "'as is like no other buddy's son, "'for the deafness and the handiness, "'and so looked on by the grit folks, "'and tall and upright like a poplar tree, "'and me to be parted from him "'and never see him no more.' "'Come, mother, don't grieve thyself in vain,' "'said Seth, in a soothing voice. "'Thee's not half so good reason to think "'as Adam will go away as to think he'll stay with thee. "'He may say such a thing when he's in wrath, "'and he's got excuse for being wrathful sometimes, "'but his heart had never let him go.' Think how he stood by us all when it's been none so easy, paying his savings to free me from going for a soldier, and turning his earnings into wood for father, when he's got plenty of uses for his own money, and many a young man like him had have been married and settled before now. He'll never turn round and knock down his own work and forsake them as it's been the labour of his life to stand by. Don't talk to me about his marrying, said Lisbeth, crying afresh. He sets hard on that heady sorrel, as will never save a penny, and will toss up her head at at his old mother, and to think as he might a had Mary Burge, and be took partners, and be a big man with workmen under him like Mr. Burge. Dolly's told me so o'er and o'er again. If it weren't as he sets hard on that bit of a wench, as is no more use nor the gilly-flower on the wall. And he's so wise at booking and figuring, and not to know no better nor that. But, mother, thee knows we canna love just where other folks would have us. There's nobody but God can control the heart of man. I could a wished myself as Adam could a made another choice, but I won't reproach him for what he can't help, and I'm not sure but what he tries to overcome it. But it's a matter as he doesn't like to be spoke to about, and I can only pray to the Lord to bless and direct him. Ay, thee'd always ready enough at prayin', but I dunna see as thee gets much with thy prayin'. Thee want to get double earnings o' this side yule. The Methodies will never make thee half the man thy brother is, for all they are makin' a preacher on thee. "'It's partly truth thee speaks there, mother,' said Seth mildly. "'Adam's far before me, and's done more for me than I can ever do for him. "'God distributes talents to every man according as he sees good. "'But thee mustn't undervalue prayer. "'Prayer may na bring money, but it brings us what no money can buy, "'a power to keep from sin and be content with God's will, "'whatever he may please to send. "'If thee wouldst pray to God to help thee and trust in his goodness, "'thee wouldst to be so uneasy about things.' "'Uneasy!' I'm of the right on it to be uneasy. It's well seen on thee what it is never to be uneasy. Think ye away all thy earnings, 
and never be uneasy as thee's nothing laid up again a rainy day. If Adam had been as easy as thee, he'd never ha had no money to pay for thee. Take no thought for the morrow, take no thought. That's what thee'd always say, and, and what comes on it. Why is Adam has to take thought for thee? Those are the words of the Bible, mother, said Seth. They don't mean as we should be idle. They mean we shouldn't be over-anxious and worried in ourselves about what'll happen to-morrow, but do our duty and leave the rest to God's will. Ay, ay, that's the way with thee. Thee always makes a peck of thy own words out of a pint of the Bibles. I dunna see how thee to know as take no thought for the morrow means all that. And when the Bible's such a big book and thee canst read all through it, and how the pick of the text is, I canna think why thee doesna pick better words as dunna mean so much more nor they say. Adam doesna pick that un. I can understand the text as he's always a-saying, God helps them as helps their sins. "'Nay, mother,' said Seth, "'that's no text of the Bible. "'It comes out of a book as Adam picked up at the stall at Treddleson. "'It was wrote by a knowing man, but overworldly, I doubt. "'However, that saying's partly true, "'for the Bible tells us we must be workers together with God.' "'Well, how am I to know? "'It sounds like a text. "'But what's the matter with the lad? "'They'd hardly eaten a bit of supper. "'Doesn't mean to ha no more, nor that bit of oak cake. "'And thee looks as white as a flick of new bacon. "'What's the matter with thee?' "'Nothing to mind about, mother. I'm not hungry. I'll just look in at Adam again and see if he'll let me go on with the coffin.' "'Ha' a drop o' warm broth,' said Lisbeth, whose motherly feeling now got the better of her nattering habit. "'I'll set two, three sticks o' light in a minute.' "'Nay, mother, thank thee. Thee very good,' said Seth gratefully, and encouraged by this touch of tenderness, he went on. "'Let me pray a bit with thee for father, and Adam, and all of us. "'It'll comfort thee. Happen more than thee think'st. Well, I've nothing to say again it. Lisbeth, though disposed always to take the negative side in her conversations with Seth, had a vague sense that there was some comfort and safety in the fact of his piety, and that it somehow relieved her from the trouble of any spiritual transactions on her own behalf. So the mother and son knelt down together, and Seth prayed for the poor wandering father, and for those who were sorrowing for him at home. And when he came to the petition that Adam might never be called to set up his tent in a far country, but that his mother might be cheered and comforted by his presence all the days of her pilgrimage, Lisbeth's ready tears flowed again, and she wept aloud. When they rose from their knees, Seth went to Adam again and said, "'Wilt only lie down for an hour or two, and let me go on the while?' "'No, Seth, no. Make mother go to bed, and go thyself.' Meantime Lisbeth had dried her eyes, and now followed Seth, holding something in her hands. It was the brown and yellow platter containing the baked potatoes with the gravy in them, and bits of meat which she had cut and mixed among them. Those were dear times, when wheaten bread and fresh meat were delicacies to working people. She set the dish down rather timidly on the bench by Adam's side, and said, "'Thee canst pick a bit while thee workin'. I'll bring thee another drop o' water.' "'Ay, mother, do,' said Adam kindly. "'I'm getting very thirsty.' In half an hour all was quiet. No sound was to be heard in the house but the loud ticking of the old day clock and the ringing of Adam's tools. The night was very still. When Adam opened the door to look out at twelve o'clock, the only motion seemed to be in the glowing, twinkling stars. Every blade of grass was asleep. Bodily haste and exertion usually leave our thoughts very much at the mercy of our feelings and imagination. And it was so to-night with Adam. While his muscles were working lustily, his mind seemed as passive as a spectator at a diorama. Scenes of the sad past, and probably sad future, floating before him and giving place one to the other in swift succession. He saw how it would be to-morrow morning, when he had carried the coffin to Broxton and was at home again, having his breakfast. His father, perhaps, would come in, ashamed to meet his son's glance, would sit down, looking older and more tottering than he had done the morning before, and hang down his head, examining the floor quarries, while Lisbeth would ask him how he supposed the coffin had been got ready, that he had slinked off and left undone, for Lisbeth was always the first to utter the word of reproach, though she cried at Adam's severity toward her father. So it will go on, worsening and worsening, thought Adam. There's no slipping up hill again, and no standing still when once you've begun to slip down. And then the day came back to him when he was a little fellow, and used to run by his father's side, proud to be taken out to work and prouder still to hear his father boasting to his fellow workmen how the little chap had an uncommon notion o' carpentering. What a fine, active fellow his father was then, 
When people asked Adam whose little lad he was, he had a sense of distinction as he answered, I'm Thias Bede's lad. He was quite sure everybody knew Thias Bede. Didn't he make the wonderful pigeon house at Broxton Parsonage? Those were happy days, especially when Seth, who was three years the younger, began to go out working too, and Adam began to be a teacher as well as a learner. But then came the days of sadness, when Adam was some way on in his teens, and Thias began to loiter at the public houses, and Lisbeth began to cry at home, and to pour forth her plaints in the hearing of her sons. Adam remembered well the night of shame and anguish when he first saw his father quite wild and foolish, shouting a song out fitfully among his drunken companions at the wagon overthrown. He had run away once, when he was only eighteen, making his escape in the morning twilight with a little blue bundle over his shoulder and his mensuration book in his pocket, and saying to himself very decidedly that he could bear the vexations of home no longer. He would go and seek his fortune, setting up his stick at the crossways and bending his steps the way it fell. But by the time he got to Stoniton, the thought of his mother and Seth, left behind to endure everything without him, became too importunate, and his resolution failed him. He came back the next day, but the misery and terror his mother had gone through in those two days had haunted her ever since. No, Adam said to himself to-night, that must never happen again. It'd make a poor balance when my doings are cast up at the last, if my poor old mother stood o' the wrong side. My back's broad enough and strong enough. I should be no better than a coward to go away and leave the troubles to be borne by them as aren't half so able. They that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of those that are weak, and not to please themselves. There's a text wants no candle to show it. It shines by its own light. It's plain enough you get into the wrong road of this life if you run after this and that only for the sake of making things easy and pleasant to yourself. A pig may poke his nose into the trough and think of nothing outside it, but if you've got a man's heart and soul in you, you can't be easy a making your own bed and leaving the rest to lie on the stones. Nay, nay, I'll never slip my neck out of the yoke and leave the load to be drawn by the weakens. Father's a sore cross to me, and's likely to be for many a long year to come. What then? I've got the health and the limbs and the spirit to bear it. At this moment a smart rap, as if with a willow wand, was given at the house door, and Jip, instead of barking as might have been expected, gave a loud howl. Adam, very much startled, went at once to the door and opened it. Nothing was there. All was still, as when he opened it an hour before. The leaves were motionless, and the light of the stars showed the placid fields on both sides of the brook quite empty of visible life. Adam walked round the house and still saw nothing except a rat which darted into the woodshed as he passed. He went in again, wondering. The sound was so peculiar that the moment he heard it it called up the image of the willow wand striking the door. He could not help a little shudder, as he remembered how often his mother had told him of just such a sound coming as a sign when someone was dying. Adam was not a man to be gratuitously superstitious, but he had the blood of the peasant in him as well as of the artisan and a peasant can no more help believing in a traditional superstition than a horse can help trembling when he sees a camel. Besides, he had that mental combination which is at once humble in the region of mystery and keen in the region of knowledge. It was the depth of his reverence quite as much as his hard common sense which gave him his disinclination to doctrinal religion, and he often checked Seth's argumentative spiritualism by saying, "Eh, it's a big mystery. Thee knowest but little about it. And so it happened that Adam was at once penetrating and credulous. If a new building had fallen down, and he had been told that this was divine judgment, he would have said, Maybe, but the barren of the roof and walls wasn't right, else it wouldn't have come down. Yet he believed in dreams and prognostics, and to his dying day he bated his breath a little when he told the story of the stroke with the willow wand. I tell it as he told it, not attempting to reduce it to its natural elements. In our eagerness to explain impressions we often lose our hold of the sympathy that comprehends them. But he had the best antidote against imaginative dread in the necessity for getting on with the coffin, and for the next ten minutes his hammer was ringing so uninterruptedly that other sounds, if there were any, might well be overpowered. A pause came, however, when he had to take up his ruler, and now again came the strange rap, and again Jip howled. Adam was at the door without the loss of a moment, but again all was still, and the starlight showed there was nothing but the dew-laden grass in front of the cottage. Adam for a moment thought uncomfortably about his father, 
but of late years he had never come home at dark hours from Treddleston, and there was every reason for believing that he was then sleeping off his drunkenness at the wagon overthrown. Besides, to Adam the conception of the future was so inseparable from the painful image of his father that the fear of any fatal accident to him was excluded by the deeply infixed fear of his continual degradation. The next thought that occurred to him was one that made him slip off his shoes and tread lightly upstairs to listen at the bedroom doors. But both Seth and his mother were breathing regularly. Adam came down and set to work again, saying to himself, I won't open the door again. It's no use staring about to catch sight of a sound. Maybe there's a world about us as we can't see, but the ear's quicker than the eye and catches a sound from it now and then. Some people think they got a sight on it, too, but they're mostly folks whose eyes are not much used to em at anything else. For my part, I think it's better to see when your perpendicular's true than to see a ghost. Such thoughts as these are apt to grow stronger and stronger as daylight quenches the candles and the birds begin to sing. By the time the red sunlight shone on the brass nails that formed the initials on the lid of the coffin, any lingering foreboding from the sound of the willow wand was merged in satisfaction that the work was done and the promise redeemed. There was no need to call Seth, for he was already moving overhead, and presently came downstairs. "'Now, lad,' said Adam, as Seth made his appearance, "'the coffin's done, and we can take it over to Broxton and be back again before half after six. I'll take a mouthful of oat cake, and then we'll be off.' The coffin was soon propped on the tall shoulders of the two brothers, and they were making their way, followed close by Jip, out of the little wood-yard into the lane at the back of the house. It was but about a mile and a half to Broxton, over the opposite slope, and their road wound very pleasantly along lanes and across fields, where the pale woodbines and the dog-roses were scenting the hedgerows, and the birds were twittering and trilling in the tall leafy boughs of oak and elm. It was a strangely mingled picture, the fresh youth of the summer morning with its Eden-like peace and loveliness, the stalwart strength of the two brothers in their rusty working clothes, and the long coffin on their shoulders. They paused for the last time before a small farmhouse outside the village of Broxton. By six o'clock the task was done, the coffin nailed down, and Adam and Seth were on their way home. They chose a shorter way homewards, which would take them across the fields and the brook in front of the house. Adam had not mentioned to Seth what had happened in the night, but he still retained sufficient impression from it himself to say, "'Seth, lad, if father isn't come home by the time we've had our breakfast, I think it'll be as well for thee to go over to Treddleson and look after him, and thee canst get me the brass wire I want. Never mind about losing an hour at thy work, we can make that up. What dost say?' "'I'm willing,' said Seth. "'But see what clouds have gathered since we set out. I'm thinking we shall have more rain.' It'll be a sore time for the haymaking if the meadows are flooded again. The brook's fine and full now, another day's rain would cover the plank, and we should have to go round by the road. They were coming across the valley now, and had entered the pasture through which the brook ran. Why, what's that sticking against the willow? continued Seth, beginning to walk faster. Adam's heart rose to his mouth. The vague anxiety about his father was changed into a great dread. He made no answer to Seth, but ran forward, preceded by Jip, who began to bark uneasily, and in two moments he was at the bridge. This was what the omen meant then, and the grey-haired father, of whom he had thought with a sort of hardness a few hours ago, as certain to live to be a thorn in his side, was perhaps even then struggling with that watery death. This was the first thought that flashed through Adam's conscience, before he had time to seize the coat and drag out the tall, heavy body. Seth was already by his side helping him, and when they had it on the bank the two sons in the first moment knelt and looked with mute awe at the glazed eyes forgetting that there was need for action, forgetting everything but that their father lay dead before them. Adam was the first to speak. "'I'll run to mother,' he said, in a loud whisper. "'I'll be back to thee in a minute.' Poor Lisbeth was busy preparing her son's breakfast, and their porridge was already steaming on the fire. Her kitchen always looked the pink of cleanliness, but this morning she was more than usually bent on making her hearth and breakfast table look comfortable and inviting. "'The lads'll be fine and hungry,' she said half aloud, as she stirred the porridge. "'It's a good step to Broxton, and it's hungry air over the hill. "'With that heavy coffin, too. "'Eh, it's heavier now, with poor Bob Fuller in it. "'However, I've made a dret more porridge nor common this morning. "'The feather'll happen to come in arter a bit. "'Not as he like much porridge. "'He swallows six penn'orth o' al and saves a ha'p'orth o' porridge. "'That's his way o' layin' by money, as I've told him many a time, "'and am likely to tell him again before the day's out. 
Ah, poor man, he takes it quiet enough, there's no denying that. But now Lisbeth heard the heavy thud of a running footstep on the turf, and turning quickly towards the door she saw Adam enter, looking so pale and overwhelmed that she screamed aloud and rushed towards him before he had time to speak. "'Hush, mother,' Adam said rather hoarsely. "'Don't be frightened. Father's tumbled into the water. Belike we may bring him round again. Seth and me are going to carry him in, get a blanket, and make it as hot as the fire.' In reality Adam was convinced that his father was dead, but he knew there was no other way of repressing his mother's impetuous wailing grief than by occupying her with some active task which had hope in it. He ran back to Seth, and the two sons lifted the sad burden in heart-stricken silence. The wide-open glazed eyes were grey, like Seth's, and had once looked with mild pride on the boys before whom Thias had lived to hang his head in shame. Seth's chief feeling was awe and distress at this sudden snatching away of his father's soul, but Adam's mind rushed back over the past in a flood of relenting and pity. When death, the great reconciler, has come, it is never our tenderness that we repent of, but our severity. End of chapter 4《Adam Bede》by George Eliot Chapter 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 5 The Rector Before twelve o'clock there had been some heavy storms of rain, and the water lay in deep gutters on the side of the gravel walks in the garden of Broxton Parsonage. The great Provence roses had been cruelly tossed by the wind and beaten by the rain, and all the delicate stemmed border flowers had been dashed down and stained with the wet soil. A melancholy morning, because it was nearly time hay harvest should begin, and instead of that the meadows were likely to be flooded. But people who have pleasant homes get indoor enjoyments that they would never think of but for the rain. If it had not been a wet morning, Mr. Irwine would not have been in the dining-room playing at chess with his mother, and he loves both his mother and chess quite well enough to pass some cloudy hours very easily by their help. Let me take you into that dining-room and show you the Reverend Adolphus Irwine, rector of Broxton, vicar of Hayslope, and vicar of Blythe, a pluralist at whom the severest church reformer would have found it difficult to look sour. We will enter very softly and stand still in the doorway, without awaking the glossy brown setter who is stretched across the hearth, with her two puppies beside her, or the pug who is dozing with his black muzzle aloft like a sleepy president. The room is a large and lofty one, with an ample, maligned, oriel window at one end. The walls you see are new and not yet painted, but the furniture, though originally of an expensive sort, is old and scanty, and there is no drapery about the window. The crimson cloth over the large dining-table is very threadbare, though it contrasts pleasantly enough with the dead hue of the plaster on the walls. But on this cloth there is a massive silver waiter with a decanter of water on it, of the same pattern as two larger ones that are propped up on the sideboard, with a coat of arms conspicuous in their centre. You suspect at once that the inhabitants of this room have inherited more blood than wealth, and would not be surprised to find that Mr. Irwine had a finely cut nostril and upper lip, but at present we can only see that he has a broad, flat back and an abundance of powdered hair, all thrown backward and tied behind with a black ribbon, a bit of conservatism in costume which tells you that he is not a young man. He will perhaps turn round by and by, and in the meantime we can look at that stately old lady, his mother, a beautiful aged brunette, whose rich-toned complexion is well set off by the complex wrappings of pure white cambric and lace about her head and neck. She is as erect in her comely embonpoint as a statue of Ceres, and her dark face with its delicate aquiline nose, firm proud mouth and small intense black eye is so keen and sarcastic in its expression that you instinctively substitute a pack of cards for the chessmen and imagine her telling your fortune. The small brown hand with which she is lifting her queen is laden with pearls, diamonds, and turquoises, and a large black veil is very carefully adjusted over the crown of her cap, 
and falls in sharp contrast on the white folds about her neck. It must take a long time to dress that old lady in the morning, but it seems a law of nature that she should be dressed so. She is clearly one of those children of royalty who have never doubted their right divine, and never met with any one so absurd as to question it. "'There, Dauphin, tell me what that is,' says the magnificent old lady as she deposits her queen very quietly and folds her arms. "'I should be sorry to utter a word disagreeable to your feelings.' "'Ah, you witch-mother, you sorceress! How is a Christian man to win a game off you? I should have sprinkled the board with holy water before we began. You've not won that game by fair means now, so don't pretend it.' "'Yes, yes, that's what the beaten have always said of great conquerors. But see, there's the sunshine falling on the board, to show you more clearly what a foolish move you made with the pawn. Come, shall I give you another chance?' "'No, mother, I shall leave you to your own conscience now it's clearing up. "'We must go and plash up the mud a little, mustn't we, Juno?' "'This was addressed to the brown setter, who had jumped up at the sound of the voices "'and laid her nose in an insinuating way on her master's leg. "'But I must go upstairs first and see Anne. "'I was called away to Tholer's funeral just as I was going before. "'It's of no use, child, she can't speak to you. "'Kate says she has one of her worst headaches this morning.' "'Oh, she likes me to go and see her just the same. "'She's never too ill to care about that. "'If you know how much of human speech "'is mere purposeless impulse or habit, "'you will not wonder when I tell you "'that this identical objection had been made "'and had received the same kind of answer "'many hundred times in the course of the fifteen years "'that Mr. Irwine's sister Anne had been an invalid. "'Splendid old ladies who take a long time to dress in the morning "'have often a slight sympathy with sickly daughters.' But while Mr. Irwine was still seated, leaning back in his chair and stroking Juno's head, the servant came to the door and said, "'If you please, sir, Joshua Rann wishes to speak with you, if you are at liberty.' "'Let him be shown in here,' said Mrs. Irwine, taking up her knitting. "'I always like to hear what Mr. Rann has got to say. His shoes will be dirty, but see that he wipes them, Carol.' In two minutes Mr. Rann appeared at the door with very deferential bows, which, however, were far from conciliating Pug, who gave a sharp bark and ran across the room to reconnoitre the stranger's legs, while the two puppies, regarding Mr. Rand's prominent calf and ribbed worsted stockings, from a more sensuous point of view, plunged and growled over them in great enjoyment. Meantime, Mr. Irwin turned round in his chair and said, "'Well, Joshua, anything the matter at Hayslope?' "'that you've come over this damp morning? "'Sit down, sit down. "'Never mind the dogs. "'Give them a friendly kick. "'Here, Pug, you rascal!' "'It is very pleasant to see some men turn around. "'Pleasant as a sudden rush of warm air in winter, "'or the flash of firelight in the chill dusk. "'Mr. Irwine was one of those men. "'He bore the same sort of resemblance to his mother "'that our loving memory of a friend's face "'often bears to the face itself. "'The lines were all more generous.' the smile brighter, the expression heartier. If the outline had been less finely cut, his face might have been called jolly, but that was not the right word for its mixture of bonhomie and distinction. "'Thank your reverence,' answered Mr. Wren, endeavouring to look unconcerned about his legs, but shaking them alternately to keep off the puppies. "'I'll stand, if you please, as more becoming. I hope I see you and Mrs. Irwine well, and, and Miss Irwine, and Miss Anne, I hope, as, as well as usual.' "'Yes, Joshua, thank you. "'You see how blooming my mother looks. "'She beats us younger people hollow. "'But what's the matter?' "'Well, sir, I had come to Brox on to deliver some works, "'and I thought it but right to call and let you know "'the goings-on as there's been in the village, "'such as I had a seen in my time. "'And I've lived in it, man and boy, sixty year, come St. Thomas, "'and collected Easter Jews from Mr. Blick "'before your reverence come into the parish.' and been on the rigging and the bell, every bell, and the digging every grave, and sung in the choir long before Bartle Marcy came from nobody knows where, with his counter singing and his fine anthems, and as puts everybody out by himself, one taking up after another like a sheep a bleat in the fold. I know what belongs to being a parish clerk, and I know as I should be wanting the respect to your reverence and church and king, if I was to allow such goings on without speaking. I was took by surprise, and knowed nothing on it beforehand, and I was so flustered, I was clean as if I'd lost my tools. I hadn't slept more than four hours this night, as they passed and gone, 
and then it was nothing but a nightmare as tired me worse no waking. Why, what in the world is the matter, Joshua? Have the thieves been at church again? Thieves? No, sir, and yet, as I may say, it is thieves, and a thief in the church too. It's the Methodists as is like to get up a hand in the parish, if your reference and his honour, Squire Donathorn, don't I think well to say the word and forbid it? Not as I dictating to you, sir. I'm not forgetting myself so far as to be wise above my betters. However, whether I'm wise or no, that's neither here nor there, but what I've got to say, I say, as the young Methodist woman, as is Mr. Poyers, was a-preaching and a-praying on the green last night, as sure as I'm a-standing before your reverence now. Preaching on the green? said Mr. Irwine, looking surprised but quite serene. What, that pale young woman I've seen at Poyser's? I saw she was a Methodist or a Quaker or something of that sort by her dress, but I didn't know she was a preacher. It's a true word, as I say, sir, rejoined Mr. Wren, compressing his mouth into a semi-circular form, and pausing long enough to indicate three notes of exclamation. She preached on the green last night, and she laid hold of Chad's best as the girl been a fit swelly ever sin. Well, Bessie Crange is a hearty-looking lass. I dare say she'll come around again, Joshua. Did anybody else go into fits? No, sir, I cannot say as they did. But there's no knowing what'll come, if we're to have such preaching as that going on every week. There'll be no living in the village. For them Methodists make folks believe as they take a mug of drink extra and make themselves a bit comfortable. They'll have to go to hell for it, sure as they're born. I'm not a tippling man nor a drunkard. Nobody could say it on me. But I like extra quarter Easter or Christmas time, and it's natural when we're going the round to singing and folks offer the, you for nothing, or when I'm a collecting the dues, and I like a point with my pipe, and a neighbourly chat at Mr. Caston's now and then, for I was brought up in the church, thank God. Uh, I've been a parish clerk this two and thirty year. I should know what the church religion is. Well, what's your advice, Joshua? What do you think should be done? Well, Your Reverence. I'm not for taking any measures again, the young woman. She's well enough if she'd let her own preaching, as I, I hear she's a-going away back to her own country soon. She's Mr. Poyser's own niece, and a, I don't wish to say was always disrespectful of the family of the Hall Farm, as I measured for shoes, little and big, and Willie, ever since I've been a shoemaker. Well, there's that Will Maskery, sir, as is the rampagious Methodist as can be, and I make no doubt it was him as stirred up the young woman to preach last night, and he'll be bringing other folks to preach from treadles on, if his comb mean cut a bit, and I think as he should be let know, as he isn't a have the making and amending the church carts and implements, let alone staying at that house as yard as a squire Donathorn's. Well, but you say yourself, Joshua, that you never knew anyone come to preach on the green before. Why should you think they'll come again? The Methodists don't come to preach in little villages like Hayslope, where there's only a handful of labourers too tired to listen to them. They might as well go and preach on the Binton Hills. Will Maskery is no preacher himself, I think. Nay, sir, he's no gift at stringing the words together with our book. He'll be struck fast like a cow with wet clay, but he's got tongue enough to speak disrespectful about nebbers, for he said, as I was blind Pharisee, I use in the Bible in that way to find nicknames for folks as are his elders and betters. And what's worse, he's been heard to say very unbecoming words about your reverence, for I could bring them as it's swear he called you a dumb dog and an idle shepherd. You'll forgive me for saying such things over again. Better not, better not, Joshua. Let evil words die as soon as they're spoken. Will Maskery might be a great deal worse fellow than he is. He used to be a wild drunken rascal, neglecting his work and beating his wife, they told me. Now he's thrifty and decent, and he and his wife look comfortable together. If you can bring me any proof that he interferes with his neighbours and creates any disturbance, I shall think it my duty as a clergyman and a magistrate to interfere. But it wouldn't become wise people like you and me to be making a fuss about trifles, as if we thought the church was in danger because Will Maskery lets his tongue wag rather foolishly, or a young woman talks in a serious way to a handful of people on the green. We must live and let live, Joshua, in religion as well as in other things. You go on doing your duty as parish clerk and sexton, as well as you've always done it, and making those capital thick boots for your neighbours, and things won't go far wrong in Hayslope, depend on it. Your reverence is very good to say so, and I'm sensible as... You're not living in a parish, there's more upon my shoulders. 
to be sure, and, and you must mind and not lower the church in people's eyes by seeming to be frightened about it for a little thing, Joshua. I shall trust to your good sense. Now to take no notice at all of what Will Maskery says, either about you or me. You and your neighbours can go on taking your pot of beer soberly when you've done your day's work like good churchmen, and if Will Maskery doesn't like to join you, but to go to a prayer meeting at Traddleston instead, let him. That's no business of yours, as long as he doesn't hinder you from doing what you like. And as to people saying a few idle words about us, we must not mind that any more than the old church steeple minds the rooks cawing about it. Will Maskery comes to church every Sunday afternoon, and does his wheelwright's business steadily in the weekdays, and as long as he does that he must be less alone. Ah, sir, but when he comes to church he sits and shakes his head, and looks as sour as in coxy when we're a-singin', as I should like to fetch him a rap across the jowl, God forgive me, and Miss Irwan, and your reverence too, for speaking as all afore you. And he said as our Christmas singing was no better nor the crackling of thorns under a pot. Well, he's got a bad ear for music, Joshua. When people have wooden heads, you know, it can't be helped. He won't bring the other people in haste up round his opinion, while you go on singing as well as you do. Yes, sir, but it turns a man's stomach to hear the scripture misused in that way. I know as much of the words of the Bible as he does, and could say the Psalms right through in my sleep if you was to pinch me. But I know better nor to take him to say it in my own way with, oh, I might as well take the sacrament cup home and use it as meals. That's a very sensible remark of yours, Joshua. But as I said before, while Mr. Irwine was speaking, the sound of a booted step and the clink of a spur were heard on the stone floor of the entrance hall, and Joshua Rann moved hastily aside from the doorway to make room for someone who paused there and said in a ringing tenor voice, Godson Arthur, may he come in? Come in, come in, Godson, Mrs. Irwine answered in the deep half-masculine tone which belongs to the vigorous old woman, and there entered a young gentleman in a riding dress, with his right arm in a sling, whereupon followed that pleasant confusion of laughing interjections, and handshakings, and how are you's, mingled with joyous short barks and wagging of tails on the part of the canine members of the family, which tells us that the visitor is on the best terms with the visited. The young gentleman was Arthur Donathon, known in Hayslope variously as the young squire, the heir, and the captain. He was only a captain in the Loamshire militia, but to the Hayslope tenants he was more intensely a captain than all the young gentlemen of the same rank in His Majesty's regulars. He unshunned them as the planet Jupiter outshines the Milky Way. If you want to know more particularly how he looked, call to your remembrance some tawny-whiskered, brown-locked, clear-complexioned young Englishman whom you have met with in a foreign town, and have been proud of as a fellow countryman, well-washed, high-bred, white-handed, yet looking as if he could deliver well from the left shoulder and floor his man. I will not be so much of a tailor as to trouble your imagination with the difference of costume, and insist on the striped waistcoat, long-tailed coat, and low-top boots. Turning round to take a chair, Captain Donathorne said, "'But don't let me interrupt Joshua's business. He has something to say.' Uh, "'Humbly you're begging your honour's pardon,' said Joshua, bowing low. There was one thing I have to say to his reverence, as other things had drove out of my head. Outwitted Joshua quickly, said Mr. Irwin. Belike, sir, you and er uh, haven't heard as Thias Bede's dead, drowned this morning, or more like overnight, in, in the Willowbrook, again the bridge, right before the house. Ah! exclaimed both gentlemen at once, as if they were a good deal interested in the information. And, and said Speed's been to me this morning, and he wished me to tell your reverence, as his brother Adam begged of you particular, to allow his father's grave to be dug by the white thorn, because his mother sat out on it, on account of a dream she had, and they had come themselves to ask you, but they got so much to see after with the crown and, and that, and their mothers took on so, and wants um, to make sure of uh, the spot for fear somebody else should take it. And if your reverence sees well and good, I'll send my boy to tell him as, as soon as I get home, and that's why I, I make bold to trouble you with his honour being present. To be sure, Joshua, to be sure, they shall have it. I'll ride round to Adam myself and see him. Send your boy, however, to say that they shall have the grave, lest anything should happen to detain me. And now, good morning, Joshua. Go into the kitchen and have some ale. Poor old Thias, said Mr. Irwine, when Joshua was gone. I'm afraid the drink helped the brook to drown him. I should have been glad for the load 
to have been taken off my friend Adam's shoulders in a less painful way. That fine fellow has been propping up his father from ruin for the last five or six years. He's a regular tramp, is Adam, said Captain Donathorn. When I was a little fellow, and Adam was a strapping lad of fifteen, and taught me carpenting, I used to think if ever I was a rich sultan I would make Adam my grand vizier. And I believe now he should bear the exultation as well as any poor wise man in the eastern story. If ever I live to be a large acred man instead of a poor devil with a mortgaged allowance of pocket money, I'll have Adam for my right hand. He shall manage my woods for me, for he seems to have a better notion of those things than any man I've ever met with. And I know he would make twice the money of them that my grandfather does with that miserable old satchel to manage, who understands no more about timber than an old carp. I've mentioned the subject to my grandfather once or twice, but for some reason or other he has a dislike to Adam, and I can do nothing. But come, your reverence, are you for a ride with me? It's splendid out of doors now. We can go to Adam's together if you like, but I want to call at the hall farm on my way to look at the whelps poiser is keeping for me. You must stay and have lunch first, Arthur, said Mrs. Irwine. It's nearly two. Carol will bring it in directly. I want to go to the hall farm too, said Mr. Irwine. To take another look at a little Methodist who was staying there. Joshua tells me she was preaching on the green last night. Oh, by Jove, said Captain Donathorn, laughing. Why, she looks as quiet as a mouse. There's something rather striking about her, though. I positively felt quite bashful the first time I saw her. She was sitting stooping over her sewing in the sunshine outside the house when I rode up and called out, without noticing that she was a stranger. Is Martin Poyser at home, I declare, when she got up and looked at me and just said, He's in the house, I believe. I'll go and call him. I felt quite ashamed of having spoken so abruptly to her. She looked like St. Catherine in a Quaker dress. It's a type of face one rarely sees among our common people. I should like to see the young woman, Dauphin, said Mrs. Irwine. Make her come here on some pretext or other. I don't know how I can manage that, mother. It will hardly do for me to patronize a Methodist preacher, even if she would consent to be patronized by an idle shepherd, as Will Maskery calls me. You should have come in a little sooner, Arthur, to hear Joshua's denunciation of his neighbor, Will Maskery. The old fellow wants me to excommunicate the wheelwright, and then deliver him over to the civil arm, that is to say, to your grandfather, to be turned out of house and yard. If I chose to interfere in this business now, I might get up as pretty a story of hatred and persecution as the Methodists need desire to publish in the next number of their magazine. It wouldn't take me much trouble to persuade Chad Cranage and half a dozen other bull-headed fellows that they would be doing an acceptable service to the church by hunting Will Maskery out of the village with rope ends and pitchforks, and then, when I had furnished them with half a sovereign to get gloriously drunk after their exertions, I should have put the climax to as pretty a farce as any of my brother clergy have set going in their parages for the last thirty years. It's really insolent of the man, though, to call you an idle shepherd and a dumb dog, said Mrs. Irwine. I should be inclined to check him a little there. You're too easy-tempered, Dauphin. Why, mother, you don't think it would be a good way of sustaining my dignity to set about vindicating myself from the aspersions of Will Maskery? Besides, I'm not so sure they are aspersions. I am a lazy fellow, and get terribly heavy in my saddle, not to mention that I'm always spending more than I can afford in bricks and mortar, so that I get savage at a lame beggar when he asks me for sixpence. Those poor lean cobblers who think that they can help to regenerate mankind by setting out to preach in the morning twilight before they have begun their day's work may well have a poor opinion of me. But come, let us have a luncheon. Isn't Kate coming to lunch? "'Miss Irwine told Bridget to take her lunch upstairs,' said Carol. "'She can't leave Miss Anne.' "'Oh, very well. Tell Bridget to say I'll go up and see Miss Anne presently. "'You can use your right arm quite well now, Arthur,' Mr. Irwine continued, "'observing that Captain Donathorn had taken his arm out of the sling. "'Yes, pretty well, but Goodwin insists on my keeping it up constantly for some time to come. "'I hope I shall be able to get away to the regiment, though, in the beginning of August.' It is a desperately dull business being shut up at the chase in the summer months, when one can neither hunt nor shoot, so as to make oneself pleasantly sleepy in the evening. However, we are to astonish the echoes on the 30th of July. My grandfather has given me carte blanche for once, and I promise you the entertainment shall be worthy of the occasion. The world shall not see the grand epoch of my majority twice. I think I shall have a lofty throne for you, Grandmamma. Or rather, too, one in the lawn and another in the ballroom, that you may sit and look down upon us like an Olympian goddess. 
I mean to bring out my best brocade that I wore at your christening twenty years ago, said Mrs. Irwin. Ah, I think I shall like your poor mother flitting about in her white dress, which looked to me almost like a shroud that very day, and it was her shroud only three months after, and your little cap and christening dress were buried with her too. She had set her heart on that sweet soul. Thank God you take after your mother's family, Arthur. If you had been a puny, wiry, yellow baby, I wouldn't have stood grandmother to you. I should have been sure you would turn out a Donathorn. But you were such a broad-faced, broad-chested, loud-screaming rascal. I knew you were every inch of you a tragic. But you might have been a little too hasty there, mother, said Mr. Irwine, smiling. Don't you remember how it was with Juno's last pups? One of them was the very image of its mother, but it had two or three of its father's tricks notwithstanding. Nature is clever enough to cheat even you, mother. Nonsense, child. Nature never makes a ferret in the shape of a mastiff. You'll never persuade me that I can't tell what men are by the outsides. If I don't like a man's looks, depend upon it I shall never like him. I don't want to know people that look ugly and disagreeable, any more than I want to taste dishes that look disagreeable. If they make me shudder at the first glance, I say, take them away. An ugly, piggish, or fishy eye now makes me feel quite ill. It's like a bad smell. Talking of eyes, said Captain Donnithorne, that reminds me that I've got a book I meant to bring you, Grandmamma. It came down in a parcel from London the other day. I know you are fond of queer, wizard-like stories. It's a volume of poems, lyrical ballads. Most of them seem to be twaddling stuff, but the first is in a different style. The Ancient Mariner is the title. I can hardly make head or tail of it as a story, but it's a strange, striking thing. I'll send it over to you, and there are some other books that you may like, Irwine. Pamphlets about antinomianism and evangelicism, uh, whatever they may be. I can't think what the fellow means by sending such things to me. I've written to him to desire that from henceforth he will send me no book or pamphlet on anything that ends with ism. Well, I don't know that I'm very fond of isms myself, but I may as well look at the pamphlets. Uh, they let one see what is going on. I have a little matter to attend to, Arthur, continued Mr. Irwine, rising to leave the room, and then I shall be ready to go out with you. The little matter that Mr. Irwine had to attend to took him up the stone staircase, part of the house was very old, and made him pause before a door at which he knocked gently. Come in, said a woman's voice, and he entered a room so darkened by blinds and curtains that Miss Kate, the thin middle-aged lady standing by the bedside, would not have had light enough for any sort of work, for any other sort of work than knitting which lay on the little table near her, but at present she was doing what required only the dimmest light, sponging the aching head that lay on the pillow with fresh vinegar. It was a small face, that of the poor sufferer. Perhaps it had once been pretty, but now it was worn and sallow. Miss Kate came towards her brother and whispered, "'Don't speak to her. She can't bear to be spoken to today.' Anne's eyes were closed and her brow contracted as if from intense pain. Mr. Irwine went to the bedside and took up one of the delicate hands and kissed it. A slight pressure from the small fingers told him that it was worth while to have come upstairs for the sake of doing that. He lingered a moment, looking at her, and then turned away and left the room, treading very gently. He had taken off his boots and put on slippers before he came upstairs. Whoever remembers how many things he has declined to do even for himself, rather than have the trouble of putting on or taking off his boots, will not think this last detail insignificant. And Mr. Irwine's sisters, as any person of the family within ten miles of Broxton could have testified, were such stupid, uninteresting women. It was quite a pity handsome, clever Mrs. Irwine should have had such commonplace daughters. That fine old lady herself was worth driving ten miles to see any day. Her beauty, her well-preserved faculties, and her old-fashioned dignity made her a graceful subject for conversation in turn with the King's health the sweet new patterns in cotton dresses, the news from Egypt, and Lord Dacey's lawsuit, which was fretting poor Lady Dacey to death. But no one ever thought of mentioning the Miss Irwines, except the poor people in Broxton Village, who regarded them as deep in the science of medicine, and spoke of them vaguely as the gentlefolks. If anyone had asked old Job Domelo, who gave him his flannel jacket, he would have answered, the gentlefolks last winter and Widow Steen dwelt much on the virtues of the stuff the gentlefolks gave her for her cough. Under this name, too, they were used to great effect as a means of taming refractory children, so that the sight of poor Miss Anne's sallow face 
Several small urchins had a terrified sense that she was cognizant of all their worst misdemeanours, and knew the precise number of stones with which they had intended to hit Farmer Britain's ducks. But for all who saw them through a less mythical medium, the Miss Irwines were quite superfluous existences, inartistic figures crowding the canvas of life without adequate effect. Miss Anne, indeed, if her chronic headaches could have been accounted for by a pathetic story of disappointed love, might have had some romantic interest attached to her, but no such story had either been known or invented concerning her, and the general impression was quite in accordance with the fact that both the sisters were old maids for the prosaic reason that they had never received an eligible offer. Nevertheless, to speak paradoxically, the existence of insignificant people has very important consequences in the world. It can be shown to affect the price of bread and the rate of wages, to call forth many evil tempers from the selfish, and many heroisms from the sympathetic, and, in other ways, to play no small part in the tragedy of life. And if that handsome, generous-blooded clergyman, the Reverend Adolphus Irwine, had not had these two hopelessly maiden sisters, his lot would have been shaped quite differently. He would very likely have taken a comely wife in his youth, and now, when his hair was getting grey under the powder, would have had tall sons and blooming daughters, such possessions in turn as men commonly think will repay them for all the labour they take under the sun. As it was, having with all his three livings no more than seven hundred a year, and seeking no way of keeping his splendid mother and his sickly sister, not to reckon a second sister, who was usually spoken of without any adjective, in such ladylike ease as became their birth and habits, and at the same time providing for a family of his own, he remained, you see, at the age of eight and forty a bachelor, not making any merit of that renunciation, but saying laughingly, if any one alluded to it, that he had made an excuse for many indulgences which a wife would never have allowed him, and perhaps he was the only person in the world who did not think his sisters uninteresting and superfluous, for his was one of those large-hearted, sweet-blooded natures that never know a narrow or a grudging thought, epicurean, if you will, with no enthusiasm, no self-scourging sense of duty, but yet, as you have seen, of a sufficiently subtle moral fibre to have an unwearying tenderness for obscure and monotonous suffering. It was his large-hearted indulgence that made him ignore his mother's hardness towards her daughters, which was the more striking from its contrast with her doting fondness towards himself. He held it no virtue to frown at irremediable faults. See the difference between the impression a man makes on you when you walk by his side in familiar talk, or look at him in his home, and the figure he makes when seen from a lofty historical level, or even in the eyes of a critical neighbour who thinks of him as an embodied system or opinion rather than as a man. Mr. Rowe, the travelling preacher stationed at Treddleston, had included Mr. Irwine in a general statement concerning the church clergy in the surrounding district, whom he described as men given up to the lusts of the flesh and the pride of life, hunting and shooting and adorning their houses, asking what shall we eat and what shall we drink and wherewithal shall we be clothed, careless of dispensing the bread of life to their flocks, preaching at best but a carnal and soul-benumbing morality and trafficking in the souls of men by receiving money for discharging the pastoral office in parishes where they did not as much as look on the faces of the people more than once a year. The ecclesiastical historian, too, looking into parliamentary reports of that period, finds honourable members zealous for the church, and untainted with any sympathy for the tribe of canting Methodists, making statements scarcely less melancholy than that of Mr. Rowe. And it is impossible for me to say that Mr. Irwin was altogether belied by the general classification assigned him. He really had no very lofty aims, no theological enthusiasm. If I were closely questioned, I should be obliged to confess that he felt no serious alarms about the souls of his parishioners, and would have thought it a mere loss of time to talk in a doctrinal and awakening matter to old Fayther Thaft, or even to Chad Cranage the blacksmith. If he had been in the habit of speaking theoretically, he would perhaps have said that the only healthy form religion could take in such minds was that of certain dim but strong emotions, suffusing themselves as a hallowing influence over the family affections and neighbourly duties. He thought the custom of baptism more important than its doctrine, and 
that the religious benefits the peasant drew from the church where his fathers worshipped and the sacred piece of turf where they lay buried were but slightly dependent on a clear understanding of liturgy or the sermon. Clearly the rector was not what is called in these days an earnest man. He was fonder of church history than of divinity, and had much more insight into men's characters than interest in their opinions. He was neither laborious nor obviously self-denying, nor very copious in alms-giving, and his theology, you perceive, was lax. His mental palate, indeed, was rather pagan, and found a savouriness in a quotation from Sophocles or Theocritus that was quite absent from any text in Isaiah or Amos. But if you feed your young setter on raw flesh, how can you wonder at its retaining a relish for uncooked partridge in afterlife? And Mr. Irwine's recollections of young enthusiasm and ambition were all associated with poetry and ethics that lay aloof from the Bible. On the other hand, I must plead, for I have an affectionate partiality towards the rector's memory, that he was not vindictive, and some philanthropists have been so, and that he was not intolerant. There is a rumour that some zealous theologians have not been altogether free from that blemish, and although he would probably have declined to give his body to be burned in any public cause, and was far from bestowing all his goods to feed the poor, he had that charity which has sometimes been lacking to very illustrious virtue. He was tender to other men's failings, and unwilling to impute evil. He was one of those men, and they are not the commonest, of whom we can know the best only by following them away from the marketplace, the platform, and the pulpit, entering with them into their own homes, hearing the voice with which they speak to the young and aged about their own hearthstone, and witnessing their thoughtful care for the everyday wants of everyday complaints, who take all their kindness as a matter of course, and not as a subject for panegyric. Such men happily have lived in times when great abuses flourished, and have sometimes even been the living representatives of the abuses. That is a thought which might comfort us a little under the opposite fact, that it is better sometimes not to follow great reformers of abuses beyond the thresholds of their homes. But whatever you think of Mr. Irwine now, if you had met him that June afternoon, riding on his grey cob, with his dogs running beside him, portly, upright, manly, with a good-natured smile on his finely turned lips as he talked to his dashing young companion on the bay mare, you must have felt that, however ill he harmonized with sound theories of the clerical office, he somehow harmonized extremely well with that peaceful landscape. See them in the bright sunlight, interrupted every now and then by rolling masses of cloud, ascending the slope from the Broxton side, where the tall gables and elms of the refectory predominate over the tiny, whitewashed church. They will soon be in the parish of Hayslope. The grey church tower and village roofs lie before them to the left, and farther on to the right they can just see the chimneys of the Hall Farm. This ends Chapter 5 of Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 6 of Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Adam Bede by George Eliot. The Hall Farm. Evidently, the gate is never opened, for the long grass and the great hemlocks grow close against it. And if it were opened, it is so rusty that the force necessary to turn it on its hinges would be likely to pull down the square stone-built pillars, to the detriment of the two stone lionesses, which grin with a doubtful carnivorous affability above a coat of arms surmounting each of the pillars. It would be easy enough, by the aid of the nicks in the stone pillars, to climb over the brick wall with its smooth stone coping. But by putting our eyes to the rusty bars of the gate, we can see the house well enough, and all but the very corners of the grassy enclosure. It is a very fine old place of red brick, softened by a pale, powdery lichen, which has dispersed itself with happy irregularity, so as to bring the red brick into terms of friendly companionship 
with the limestone ornaments surrounding the three gables, the windows, and the door place. But the windows are patched with wooden panes, and the door, I think, is like the gate. It is never opened. How it would groan and grate against the floor if it were! For it is a solid, heavy, handsome door, and must once have been in the habit of shutting with a sonorous bang behind the liveried lackey who had just seen his master and mistress off the grounds in a carriage and pair. But at present one might fancy the house in the early stage of a chancery suit, and that the fruit from that grand double row of walnut trees on the right hand of the enclosure would fall and rot among the grass, if it were not that we heard the booming bark of dogs echoing from the great buildings at the back. And now the half-weaned calves that have been sheltering themselves in a gorse-built hovel against the left-hand wall come out and set up a silly answer to that terrible bark, doubtless supposing that it has reference to buckets of milk. Yes, the house must be inhabited, and we will see by whom, for imagination is a licensed trespasser. It has no fear of dogs, but may climb over walls and peep in windows with impunity. Put your face to one of the glass panes in the right-hand window. What do you see? A large open fireplace with rusty dogs in it, and a bare boarded floor. At the far end, fleeces of wool stacked up. In the middle of the floor, some empty corn bags. That is the furniture of the dining room. And what through the left-hand window? Several clothes horses, a pillion, a spinning wheel, and an old box wide open and stuffed full of colored rags. At the edge of this box there lies a great wooden doll, which, so far as mutilation is concerned, bears a strong resemblance to the finest Greek sculpture, and especially in the total loss of its nose. Near it there's a little chair, and the butt end of a boy's leather long-lashed whip. The history of the house is plain now. It was once the residence of a country squire, whose family, probably dwindling down to mere spinsterhood, got merged in the more territorial name of Donnythorne. It was once the hall. Now it is the hall farm. Like the life in some coast town that was once a watering place and is now a port, where the genteel streets are silent and grass-grown, and the docks and warehouses are busy and resonant, the life of the hall has changed its focus, and no longer radiates from the parlor, but from the kitchen and the farmyard. Plenty of life there, though this is the drowsiest time of the year, just before the hay harvest. And it is the drowsiest time of day, too, for it is close upon three by the sun, and it is half-past three by Mrs. Poyser's handsome eight-day clock. But there is always a stronger sense of life when the sun is brilliant after rain, and now he is pouring down his beams and making sparkles among the wet straw, and lighting up every patch of vivid green moss on the red tiles of the cowshed, and turning even the muddy water that is hurrying along the channel to the drain into a mirror for the yellow-billed ducks who are seizing the opportunity of getting a drink with as much body in it as possible. There is quite a concert of noises. The great bulldog, chained against the stables, is thrown into furious exasperation by the unwary approach of a cock too near the mouth of his kennel, and sends forth a thundering bark, which is answered by two foxhounds shut up in the opposite cowhouse. The old top-knotted hens, scratching with their chicks among the straw, set up a sympathetic croaking as the discomfited cock joins them. A sow with her brood, all very muddy to the legs and curled as to the tail, throws in some deep staccato notes. Our friends the calves are bleeding from the home croft. And, under all, the fine ear discerns the continuous hum of human voices. For the great barn doors are thrown wide open, 
and men are busy there mending the harness under the superintendence of Mr. Gobi, the widow, otherwise Saddler, who entertains them with the latest Treddleston gossip. It is certainly rather an unfortunate day that Alec, the shepherd, has chosen for having the widows, since the morning has turned out so wet, and Mrs. Poyser has spoken her mind pretty strongly as to the dirt which the extra number of men's shoes brought into the house at dinner-time. Indeed, she has not yet recovered her equanimity on the subject, though it is now nearly three hours since dinner, and the house is pretty clean again, as clean as everything else in that wonderful house-place, where the only chance of collecting a few grains of dust would be to climb on the salt coffer, and put your finger on the high mantel shelf on which the glittering brass candlesticks are enjoying their summer sinecure. For at this time of year, of course, every one goes to bed while it is yet light, or at least light enough, to discern the outline of objects after you have bruised your shins against them. Surely nowhere else could an oak clock-case and an oak table have got such a polish by hand, genuine elbow polish, as Mrs. Poyser called it, for she thanks to God she never had any of your varnished rubbish in her house. Hetty Sorrel often took the opportunity, when her aunt's back was turned, of looking at the pleasing reflection of herself in those polished services. For the oak table was usually turned up like a screen, and was more for ornament than for use. And she could see herself, sometimes, in the great round pewter dishes that were ranged on the shelves above the long deal dinner table, or in the hobs of the grate which always shone like jasper. Everything was looking at its brightest at this moment, for the sun shone right on the pewter dishes, and from their reflecting surfaces pleasant jets of light were thrown on mellow oak and bright brass, and on a still pleasanter object than these, for some of the rays fell on Dinah's finely moulded cheek, and lit up her pale red hair to auburn, as she bent over the heavy household linens which she was mending for her aunt. No scene could have been more peaceful, if Mrs. Poyser, who was ironing a few things that still remained from the Monday's wash, had not been making a frequent clicking with her iron, and moving to and fro whenever she wanted it to cool. Carrying the keen glance of her blue-gray eye from the kitchen to the dairy, where Hetty was making up the butter, and from the dairy back to the kitchen where Nancy was taking the pies out of the oven. Do not suppose, however, that Mrs. Poyser was elderly or shrewish in her appearance. She was a good-looking woman, not more than eight and thirty, of fair complexion and sandy hair, well-shapen, light-footed. The most conspicuous article in her attire was the ample checkered linen apron, which almost covered her skirt, and nothing could be plainer or less noticeable than her cap and gown for there was no weakness of which she was less tolerant than feminine vanity, and the preference of ornament to utility. The family likeness between her and her niece Dinah Morris, with the contrast between her keenness and Dinah's seraphic gentleness of expression, might have served a painter as an excellent suggestion for a Martha and Mary. Their eyes were just of the same color, but a striking test of the difference in their operation was seen in the demeanor of Trip, the black and tan terrier, whenever that much suspected dog unwarily exposed himself to the freezing arctic ray of Mrs. Poyser's glance. Her tongue was not less keen than her eye, and whenever a damsel came within earshot, seemed to take up an unfinished lecture, as a barrel organ takes up a tune precisely at the point where it had left off. The fact that it was churning day was another reason why it was inconvenient to have the widows, and why, consequently, Mrs. Poyser should scold Molly, the housemaid, with unusual severity. To all appearance, Molly had got through her after-dinner work in an exemplary manner, had cleaned herself with great dispatch, and now came to ask submissively if she should sit down to her spinning 
till milking time. But this blameless conduct, according to Mrs. Poyser, shrouded a secret indulgence of unbecoming wishes, which she now dragged forth and held up to Molly's view with cutting eloquence. Spinning, indeed. It isn't spinning you'd be at, I'll be bound, and let you have your own way. I never knew your equals for gallowsness. To think of a gal of your age wanting to go and sit with half a dozen men. I'd have been ashamed to let the words pass over my lips if I'd have been you. And you, as have been here since last Michaelmas, and I hired you at Treddleston's Statitz, without a bit of character, as I say, you might be grateful to be hired in that way to a respectable place, and you knew no more what belongs to work when you came here than the mockins in the field. As poor a two-fisted thing as I ever saw, you know you was. Who taught you to scrub a floor, I should like to know? Why, you'd leave the dirt in heaps in the corners. Anybody would think you'd never been brought up among Christians. And as for spinning, why, you've wasted as much as your wage in the flax you've spoiled learning to spin. And you've a right to feel that, and not to go out as gaping and as thoughtless as if you'd been beholding to nobody. Comb the wool for the widows, indeed. That's what you'd like to be doing, is it? That's the way with you. That's the road you'd all like to go, headlongs to ruin. You're never easy till you've got some sweetheart, as is as big a fool as yourself. You think you'll be finally off when you're married, I dare say. And you've got a three-legged stool to sit on, and never a blanket to cover you, and a bit of oat-cake for your dinner, as three children are snatching at. I'm sure I don't want to go with the widows, Molly said, whimpering and quite overcome by the Dantean picture of her future. Only we always used to comb the wool for an at Mr. Oatley's, and so I just ask you, I don't want to set eyes on the widows again. I wish I may never stir if I do. Mr. Oatley's, indeed. It's fine talking of what you did at Mr. Oatley's. Your missus there might like her floors dirted with widows, for what I know. There's no knowing what people won't like, such ways as I never heard of. I never heard a gal come into my house as seemed to know what cleaning was. I think people live like pigs, for my part. And as to that Betty, as was dairymaid at Trent's before she come to me, she'd a left the cheeses without turning from week's end to week's end, and the dairy thralls, I might have wrote my name on em. When I come downstairs after my illness, as the doctor said it was inflammation, it was a mercy I got well of it. "'and to think of your knowing no better, Molly, "'and been here a-goin' on nine months, "'not for want of talking to, neither. "'And what are you standin' there for, "'like a jack as is run down, "'instead of getting your wheel out? "'You are a rarin' for sitting down to your work "'a little while after it's time to put by. "'Money, my iron's twite told. "'Please put it down to warm.' "'The small chirping voice that uttered this request came from a little sunny-haired girl between three and four, who, seated on a high chair at the end of the ironing table, was arduously clutching the handle of a miniature iron with her tiny fat fist, and ironing rags with an assiduity that required her to put her little red tongue out as far as anatomy would allow. "'Cold is it, my darling? Bless your sweet face,' said Mrs. Poyser, who was remarkable for the facility with which she could relapse from her official objugatory to one of fondness or of friendly converse. Never mind. Mother's done her ironing now. She's going to put the ironing things away. Money, I did like to do into the barn to Tommy to see the widowed. No, no, no. Toddy'd get her feet wet, said Mrs. Poyser, carrying away her iron. "'Run into the dairy and see your cousin Hetty make butter.' "'I did like a bit of pum take,' rejoined Toddy, "'who seemed to be provided with several relays of requests. "'At the same time, taking the opportunity of her momentary leisure "'to put her fingers into a bowl of starch "'and drag it down so as to empty the contents with tolerable completeness "'onto the ironing sheet. "'Did ever anybody see the like?' screamed Mrs. Poyser running towards the table, when her eye had fallen on the blue stream. "'The child's always in mischief, if your back's turned a minute. "'What shall I do to you, you naughty, naughty girl?' 
Toddy, however, had descended from her chair with great swiftness, and was already in retreat towards the dairy, with a sort of waddling run, and an amount of fat on the nape of her neck, which made her look like the metamorphosis of a white suckling pig. The white starch, having been wiped up by Molly's help, and the ironing apparatus put by, Mrs. Poyser took up her knitting, which always lay ready at hand, and was the work she liked best, because she could carry it on automatically as she walked to and fro. But now she came and sat down opposite Dinah, whom she looked at in a meditative way, as she knitted her worsted gray stocking. You look the image of your Aunt Judith, Dinah, when you sit a-sewing. I could almost fancy it was thirty years back, and I was a little girl at home, looking at Judith as she sat at her work after she'd done the house up. Only it was a little cottage, father's was, and not a big rambling house as gets dirty in one corner as fast as you clean it in another. But for all that, I could fancy you was your Aunt Judith, only her hair was a deal darker than yours, and she was stouter and broader in the shoulders. Judith and me always hung together, though she had such queer ways. But your mother and her could never agree. Ah, your mother little thought as she'd have a daughter just cut out after the very pattern of Judith, and leave her an orphan, too, for Judith to take care on, and bring up with a spoon when she was in the graveyard at Stoniton. I always said that at Judith, as she'd bear a pound weight any day to save anybody else carrying an ounce. And she was just the same from the first of my remembering her. It made no difference in her, as I could see, when she took to the Methodists, only she talked a bit different, and wore a different sort of cap. But she'd never in her life spent a penny on herself, more than keeping herself decent. She was a blessed woman, said Dinah. God had given her a loving, self-forgetting nature, and he perfected it by grace. And she was very fond of you, too, Aunt Rachel. I often heard her talk of you in the same sort of way. When she had that bad illness, and I was only eleven years old, she used to say, You'll have a friend on earth in your Aunt Rachel, if I'm taken from you, for she has a kind heart, and I'm sure I've found it so. I don't know how, child, anybody'd be cunning to do anything for you, I think. You're like the birds of the air, and live nobody knows how. And I have been glad to behave to you like a mother's sister, if you'd come and live in this country where there's some shelter and victual for man and beast, and folks don't live on the naked hills like poultry a scratching on a gravel bank. And then you might get married to some decent man, and there'd be plenty ready to have you, if only you'd leave off that preaching, as is ten times worse than anything your Aunt Judith ever did. And even if you'd marry Seth Bede, as is a poor, wool-gathering Methodist, and is never like to have a penny beforehand, I know your uncle'd help you with a pig, and very like a cow, for he's always been good-natured to my kin, for all they're poor, and made him welcome to the house, and it'd do for you, I'll be bound, as much as ever he'd do for Hetty, though she's his own niece. And there's linen in the house, as I could well spare you, for I got lots of sheeting and table clothing and toweling as isn't made up. There's a piece of sheeting I could give you as that squinting Katie spun. She was a rare girl to spin, for all she squinted, and the children couldn't abide her. And you know, spinning's going on constant, and there's new linen wove twice as fast as the old wears out. But where's the use of talking, if you want to be persuaded and settle down like any other woman in her senses, instead of wearing yourself out with walking and preaching and giving away every penny you get, so as you've nothing saved against sickness, and all the things you've got in the world, I verily believe, it go into a bundle no bigger nor a double cheese, and all because you got notions in your head about religion more than what's in the catechism and the prayer book, but not more than what's in the Bible, aunt said Dinah. Yes, and the Bible too, for that matter, Mrs. Poyser rejoined rather sharply. Else why shouldn't them as know best what's in the Bible, the parsons and people as have got nothing better to do but learn it, do the same as you? But for the matter of that, if everybody was to do like you, the world must come to a standstill. For if everybody tried to do without house and home, and with poor eating and drinking was always talking as we must despise things of the world, as you say, 
I should like to know where the pick of the stock and the corn and the best new milk cheeses that have to go. Everybody would be wanting bread made of tail ends, and everybody would be running after everybody else to preach to them instead of bringing up their families and laying by against a bad harvest. It stands to sense, as that can't be the right religion. Nay, dear aunt, you never heard me say that all people are called to forsake their work and their families. It's quite right the land should be plowed and sowed, and the precious corn stored, and the things of this life cared for, and right that people should rejoice in their families and provide for them, so that this is done in fear of the Lord, and that they are not unmindful of the soul's wants while they are caring for the body. We can all be servants of God wherever our lot is cast. But he gives us different sorts of work, according as he fits us for it and calls us to it. I can no more help spending my life in trying to do what I can for the souls of others than you could help running if you heard little Toddy crying at the other end of the house. The voice would go to your heart. You would think the dear child was in trouble or in danger, and you couldn't rest without running to help her and comfort her. Ah, said Mrs. Poyser, rising and walking toward the door, I know it'd be just the same if I talked to you for hours. You'd make me the same answer at the end. I might as well talk to the running brook and tell it to stand still. The causeway outside the kitchen door was dry enough now for Mrs. Poyser to stand there quite pleasantly and see what was going on in the yard the gray worsted stocking making a steady progress in her hands all the while. But she had not been standing there more than five minutes before she came in again and said to Dinah, in a rather flurried, awe-stricken tone, If there isn't Captain Donnythorne and Mr. Irwin a-coming into the yard, I'll lay my life they're coming to speak about your preaching on the green, Dinah. It's you must answer em, for I am dumb. I've said enough already about your bringing such disgrace upon your uncle's family. I wouldn't a minded if you'd been Mr. Poyser's own niece. Folks must put up with their own kin as they put up with their own noses. It's their own flesh and blood. But to think a niece of mine being the cause of my husband's being turned out of his farm, and me brought him no fording but my savings. Nay, dear Aunt Rachel, Dinah said gently, you've no cause for such fears. I have strong assurance that no evil will happen to you and my uncle and the children from anything I have done. I didn't preach without direction. Direction. I know well what you mean by direction, said Mrs. Poyser, knitting in a rapid, agitated manner. When there's a bigger maggot than usual in your head, you call it direction. And then nothing can stir you. You look like the steady on the outside of the Treddleston Church a staring and a smiling, whether it's fair weather or foul, I had a common patience with you. By this time the two gentlemen had reached the palings and had got down from their horses. It was plain they meant to come in. Mrs. Poyser advanced to the door to meet them, curtsying low and trembling between anger with Dinah and anxiety to conduct herself with perfect propriety on the occasion for in those days the keenest of bucolic minds felt a whispering awe at the sight of the gentry, such as men of old felt when they stood on tiptoe to watch the gods passing by in tall human shape. "'Well, Mrs. Boyser, how are you after this stormy morning?' said Mr. Irwin, with his stately cordiality. "'Our feet are quite dry. We shall not soil your beautiful floor.' "'Oh, sir, don't mention it,' said Mrs. Poyser. Will you and the captain please walk into the parlor? No, indeed, thank you, Mrs. Poyser, the captain said, looking eagerly round the kitchen, as if his eye were seeking something it could not find. I delight in your kitchen. I think it the most charming room I know. I should like every farmer's wife to come and look at it for a pattern. Oh, you're pleased to say so, sir. Pray take a seat, said Mrs. Poyser, relieved a little by this compliment and the captain's evident good humor but still glancing anxiously at Mr. Irwin, who, she saw, was looking at Dinah and advancing towards her. "'Poyser is not at home, is he?' said Captain Donnythorne, seating himself where he could see along the short passage to the open dairy door. "'No, sir, he isn't. He's gone to Rossiter to see Mr. West, the factor, about the wool. But there's father in the barn, sir, if he'd be of any use.' 
No, thank you. I'll just look at the whelps and leave a message about them with your shepherd. I must come another day and see your husband. I want to have a consultation with him about horses. Do you know when he's likely to be at liberty? Why, sir, you can hardly miss him, except it's on Treddleston market day. That's of a Friday, you know. For if he's anywhere on the farm, we can send for him in a minute. If we got rid of the scant lands, we should have no outlying fields, and I should be glad of it. For if anything happens, he's sure to be gone to the scant lands. Things always happen so contrary if they've a chance. And it's an unnatural thing to have one bit of your farm in one county, and all the rest in another. Ah, the scant lands would go much better with Choice's farm, especially as he wants dairy land, and we've got plenty. I think yours is the prettiest farm on the estate, though. And do you know, Mrs. Poyser, if I were going to marry and settle down, I should be tempted to turn you out and do up this fine old house and turn farmer myself. Oh, sir, said Mrs. Poyser, rather alarmed, you wouldn't like it at all. As for farming, it's putting money into your pocket with your right hand and fetching it out with your left. As far as I can see, it's raising victuals for other folks and just getting a mouthful for yourself and your children as you go along. Not as you'd be like a poor man as wants to get his bread. You could afford to lose as much money as you liked in farming. But it's poor fun losing money, I should think. Though I understand it's what the great folks in London play at more than anything. For my husband heard at market, as Lord Dacey's eldest son, had lost thousands upon thousands to the Prince of Wales, and they said my lady was going to pawn her jewels to pay for him. But you know more about that than I do, sir. But as for farming, sir, I cannot think as you'd like it. And this house, the draughts in it are enough to cut you through, and it's my opinion the floors upstairs are very rotten, and the rats in the cellar are beyond anything. Why, that's a terrible picture, Mrs. Poyser. I think I should be doing you a service to turn you out of such a place. But there's no chance of that. I'm not likely to settle for the next twenty years, till I'm a stout gentleman of forty, and my grandfather would never consent to part with such good tenants as you. Well, sir, if he thinks so well of Mr. Poyser as a tenant, I wish you could put in a word for him to allow us some new gates for the five closes, for my husband's been asking and asking till he's tired, and to think of what he's done for the farm, and's never had a penny allowed to him, be the times good or bad. And as I have said to my husband often and often, I'm sure if the captain had anything to do with it, it wouldn't be so. Not as I wish to speak disrespectful of them as got power in their hands, but it's more than flesh and blood will bear sometimes, to be toiling and striving, and up early and down late, and hardly sleeping a wink when you lie down, for thinking as the cheese may swell, or the cows may slip their calf, or the wheat may grow green again in the sheaf. And after all, at the end of the year, it's like as if you'd been cooking a feast, and had got a smell of it for your pains. Mrs. Poyser, once launched into conversation, always sailed along without any check from her preliminary awe of gentry. The confidence she felt in her own powers of exposition was a motive force that overcame all resistance. I'm afraid I should only do him harm instead of good if I were to speak about the gates, Mrs. Poyser, the captain said, though I assure you there's no man on the estate I would sooner say a word for than your husband. I know his farm is in better order than any other within ten miles of us. And as for the kitchen, he added, smiling, I don't believe there's one in the kingdom to beat it. By the by, I've never seen your dairy. I must see your dairy, Mrs. Poyser. Indeed, sir, it's not fit for you to go in, for Hetty's in the middle of making butter, for the churning was thrown late, and I'm quite ashamed. This, Mrs. Poyser said, blushing, and believing that the captain was really interested in her milk pans, and would adjust his opinion of her to the appearance of her dairy. Oh, I've no doubt it's in capital order. Take me in, said the captain, himself leading the way while Mrs. Poyser followed. End of chapter 6, The Hall Farm Chapter 7 of Adam Bede This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 7. The Dairy. The dairy was certainly worth looking at. It was a scene to sicken for a sort of calenture in hot and dusty streets. Such coolness, such purity, such fresh fragrance of new-pressed cheese, of firm butter, of wooden vessels perpetually bathed in pure water, such soft colouring of red earthenware and creamy surfaces, brown wood and polished tin, grey limestone and rich orange red rust on the iron weights and hooks and hinges, but one gets only a confused notion of these details when they surround a distractingly pretty girl of seventeen, standing on little patterns and rounding her dimpled arms to lift a pound of butter out of the scale. Hetty blushed a deep rose colour when Captain Donnithorne entered the dairy and spoke to her, but it was not at all a distressed blush, for it was enwreathed with smiles and dimples, and with sparkles from under long, curled, dark eyelashes, and while her aunt was discoursing to him about the limited amount of milk that was to be spared for butter and cheese so long as the calves were not all weaned, and a large quantity but inferior quality of milk yielded by the shorthorn, which had been bought on experiment, together with other matters which must be interesting to a young gentleman who would one day be a landlord. Hetty tossed and patted her pound of butter with quite a self-possessed, coquettish air, slyly conscious that no turn of her head was lost. There are various orders of beauty, causing men to make fools of themselves in various styles, from the desperate to the sheepish, but there is one order of beauty which seems made to turn the heads not only of men, but of all intelligent mammals, even of women. It is a beauty like that of kittens, or very small downy ducks, making gentle rippling noises with their soft bills or babies just beginning to toddle and to engage in conscious mischief, a beauty with which you can never be angry, but that you feel ready to crush for inability to comprehend the state of mind into which it throws you. Hetty Sorrel's was that sort of beauty. Her aunt, Mrs. Poyser, who professed to desire all personal attractions, and intended to be the severest of mentors, continually gazed at Hetty's charms by the sly, fascinated in spite of herself, and after administering such a scolding as naturally flowed from her anxiety to do well by her husband's niece, who had no mother of her own to scold her, poor thing, she would often confess to her husband, when they were safe out of hearing, that she firmly believed the naughtier the little hussy behaved, the prettier she looked. It is of little use for me to tell you that Hetty's cheek was like a rose petal, that dimples played about her pouting lips, that her large dark eyes hid a soft roguishness under their long lashes, and that her curly hair, though all pushed back under her round cap while she was at work, stole back in dark, delicate rings on her forehead, and about her white shell-like ears. It is of little use for me to say how lovely was the contour of her pink and white neckerchief, tucked into her low plum-coloured stuffed bodice, or how the linen butter making apron, with its bib, seemed a thing to be imitated in silk by duchesses since it fell in such charming lines, or how her brown stockings and thick sole buckled shoes lost all that clumsiness which they must certainly have had when empty of her foot and ankle of little use, unless you have seen a woman who affected you as Hetty affected her beholders, for otherwise, though you might conjure up the image of a lovely woman, she would not in the least resemble 
that distracting kitten-like maiden. I might mention all the divine charms of a bright spring day, but if you had never in your life utterly forgotten yourself in straining your eyes after the mounting lark, or in wandering through the still lanes when the fresh open blossoms filled them with a sacred silent beauty like that of fretted isles, where would be the use of my descriptive catalogue? I could never make you know what I meant by a bright spring day. Hetty's was a spring-tide beauty. It was the beauty of young frisking things, round-limbed, gamboling, circumfeiting you by a false air of innocence, the innocence of a young star-browed calf. For example, that being inclined for a promenade out of bounds, lead you a severe steeplechase over hedge and ditch, and only comes to a stand in the middle of a bog. And they are the prettiest attitudes and movements into which a pretty girl is thrown in making up butter, tossing movements that give a charming curve to the arm, and a sideward inclination of the round white neck, little patting and rolling movements with the palm of the hand, and nice adaptions and finishings which cannot at all be effected without a great play of the pouting mouth and the dark eyes. And then the butter itself seems to communicate a fresh charm. It is so pure, so sweet-scented, it is turned off the mould with such a beautiful firm surface like marble in a pale yellow light. Moreover, Hetty was particularly clever at making up the butter. It was the one performance of hers that her aunt allowed to pass without severe criticism, so she handled it with all the grace that belongs to mastery. I hope you will be ready for a great holiday on the 30th of July, Mrs. Poyser, said Captain Donnithorne when he had sufficiently admired the dairy and given several improvised opinions on sweet turnips and shorthorns. You know what is to happen then, and I shall expect you to be one of the guests who come earliest and leave latest. Will you promise me your hand for two dances, Miss Hetty? If I don't get your promise now, I know I shall hardly have a chance." for all the smart young farmers will take care to secure you. Hetty smiled and blushed, but before she could answer, Mrs. Poyser interposed, scandalised at the mere suggestion that the young squire could be excluded by any meaner partners. Indeed, sir, you are very kind to take that notice of her, and I'm sure whenever you're pleased to dance with her, She'll be proud and thankful if she stood still all the rest of the evening. Oh, no, no, that would be too cruel to all the other young fellows who can dance, but you will promise me two dances, won't you? The captain continued, determined to make Hetty look at him and speak to him. Hetty dropped the prettiest little curtsy and stole a half-shy, half-coquettish glance at him as she said, "'Yes, thank you, sir. "'And you must bring all your children, you know, Mrs. Poyser, "'your little totty, as well as the boys. "'I want all the youngest children on the estate to be there, "'all those who will be fine young men and women "'when I am a bald old fellow. "'Oh, dear, sir, that you'll be a long time first, said Mrs. Poyser quite overcome at the young squire speaking so lightly of himself, and thinking how her husband would be interested in hearing her recount this remarkable specimen of high-born humour. The captain was thought to be very full of jokes, and was a great favourite throughout the estate on account of his free manners. Every tenant was quite sure things would be different when the reins got into his hands. There was to be a millennial abundance of new gates, allowances of lime, and returns of ten per cent. But where is Totty today? he said. I want to see her. 
"'Where is the little one, Hetty?' said Mrs. Poyser. "'She came in here not long ago.' "'I don't know. She went into the brew-house to Nancy, I think.' The proud mother, unable to resist the temptation to show her totty, passed at once into the back kitchen, in search of her, not, however, without misgivings, lest something should have happened to render her person and attire unfit for presentation. "'And do you carry the butter to market when you've made it?' said Captain to Hetty, meanwhile. "'Oh, no, sir, not when it's so heavy. I'm not strong enough to carry it. Alec takes it on horseback. No, I'm sure your pretty arms were never meant for such heavy weights. But you go out a walk sometimes these pleasant evenings, don't you? Why don't you have a walk in the chase sometimes? Now it's so green and pleasant. I hardly ever see you anywhere except at home and at church. Aunt doesn't like me to go a walking only when I'm going somewhere, said Hetty but I go through the chase sometimes. And don't you ever go to see Mrs. Best, the housekeeper? I think I saw you once in the housekeeper's room. It isn't Mrs. Best, it's Mrs. Pomfret, the lady's maid, as I go to see. She's teaching me tent stitch and the lace mending. I'm going to tea with her tomorrow afternoon. The reason why there had been space for this tete-a-tete can only be known by looking into the back kitchen, where Totty had been discovered rubbing a stray blue bag against her nose, and in the same moment allowing some liberal indigo drops to fall on her afternoon pinafore. But now she appeared holding her mother's hand, the end of her round nose rather shiny from a recent and hurried application of soap and water. Here she is, said the captain, lifting her up and setting her on the low stone shelf. Here's Totty. By the by, what's her other name? She wasn't christened Totty. Oh, sir, we call her sadly out of her name, Charlotte's, her christened name. It's a name I, Mr. Poyser's family, his grandmother was named Charlotte, but we began with calling her Lottie, and now it's got to Totty. To be sure, it's more like a name for a dog than a Christian child. Totty's a capital name. Why, she looks like a Totty. Has she got a pocket on? said the captain, feeling in his own waistcoat pockets. Totty immediately, with great gravity, lifted up her frock, and showed a tiny pink pocket at present in a state of collapse. It dot nothing in it, she said as she looked down at it very earnestly. No, what a pity, such a pretty pocket. Well, I think I've got some things in mine that will make a pretty jingle in it. Yes, I declare I've got five little round silver things, and here, what a pretty noise they make in Totty's pink pocket. Here he shook the pocket with the five sixpences in it, and Totty showed her teeth and wrinkled her nose in a great glee. But, divining that, there was nothing more to be got by staying. She jumped off the shelf and ran away to jingle her pocket in the hearing of Nancy, while her mother called after her. Oh, for shame, you naughty girl! Not to thank the captain for what he's given you, I'm sure, sir. It's very kind of you, but she's spoiled shameful. Her father won't have her said nay in anything, and there's no managing her. It's been the youngest, and the only girl. Oh, she's a funny little fatty. I wouldn't have her different, but I must be going now, for I suppose the rector is waiting for me. With a good-bye, a bright glance, and a bow to Hetty Arthur, left the dairy. But he was mistaken in imagining himself waited for. The rector had been so much interested in his conversation with Dinah that he would not have chosen to close it earlier. And you shall hear now what they had been saying to each other. End of chapter 7